Welcome, Andy. I'm so glad to have you here. I've known you for a number of years now. And what really impressed me was that you could explain four, and in particular, sexual four, in a way that wasn't known at the time and was then later confirmed by Naranjos a few years later. But you made a big impression and you did a lot of different things. And so let's be, when did you first learn about the Enneagram? I first learned about the Enneagram in 1989. I had a housemate whose name was Terry Wilson. And Terry Wilson studied with Barbara Hastings. Yes. And Terry kept saying, you have to go to an Enneagram workshop with me with Barbara. She, Terry thought Barbara was the best Enneagram teacher. And she had run into, and I think Barbara was an extraordinary Enneagram teacher. Just, I want to give a kudos to Barbara. So Terry kept saying, you have to go. And I kept saying, I'm not interested in archetypal psychology, except insofar as I understand it, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so she kept bugging me because Barbara would come four times a year to Boston. And I finally said to Terry, all right, Terry, if you can get me, if you can get me into this thing for free. Now, she had said Barbara never gives discounts, let alone lets anyone in for free. So Terry said, I'll do that, because Terry had worked for Barbara as Barbara was also a, a personal growth person, and Terry could call in something. So she got me in at a major discount. So then I had to go. You had to go, yeah. I had to go, because I had told her I would go if she did. And so then I went to this thing with Barbara. I didn't know what point I was at the time. I didn't know if I was a nine, a seven, or a four. Even though in my tri-type, I'm not a nine, I'm an eight in my tri type. But I have a I have a mother who's a nine who I identified with a lot and I thought I would and they wanted to be a four seven nine, not a four seven eight. So you interjected it. Yeah. <laughs> well no, I well, no my I didn't interject my mother. I just identified with my mother, but that's a different subject. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Anyway, so the point here is that I didn't know when I went to this workshop and I actually, when I did a, a paper and pencil test of it, I came out exactly evenly in four, seven, and nine. Exactly. But the way I knew it was two ways. The first is I told Terry a poem I wrote when I was nine years old and she said, you're a four, which is true. That poem is the poem only a four could have written that poem at age nine, which if you ever want to hear a four poem that a, a nine-year-old four wrote, after you got it from a dream and just wrote down this poem, I will tell it to you. And the other thing is they put me on, now that was very interesting. I'll tell you the whole weekend was very interesting because the first panel, Helen, you know, she was doing three, six, nine, one, four, two, eight, five, seven. That's how she ran it. First thing, the first panel was a three panel. And the interesting thing was there was a person, a lot of people were there for the first time. There was a person who was a seven. Now everything he said sounded three like, but Barbara said, you may want to try a different thing. And you could tell he didn't belong there, even though he, the surface of what he was saying about how busy he was and how successful he was. I mean, all that stuff sounded three like he wasn't there. OK, so I get on the four panel after I tell Terry this poem that I wrote. I get there and there are six women and me. Right. Our stories on the surface could not be more different. Terry is a four. Terry is an accountant. And it was so fascinating to listen to Terry talk about how she made the most beautiful tax returns of anyone ever. These people, like our surface stories could not have been more different. And I was the only man there, so my surface story was very different, obviously. They were talking about the themes of their lives. And I said, oh, my, this this is home. I mean, like, and I always thought it's very weird when you're when you think you're different from everybody. You get on a panel of everybody who thinks they're different from everybody and you realize you're all the same. So. I said, this is like amazing. So I became very close to Barbara, which is a long story. And every time Barbara came, I went to her workshop. So I went to probably 12 workshops in the course of less than three years. And I read Helen's book because Barbara, of course, studied with Helen. And then I started teaching with Helen like I'm not with, with, with Barbara. We became co-teachers within like a year or two. I, yeah, I, the first one I went to, I think was 1990. And then I went to 12 of them because she came back four times a year and I was at all of them. And then I started teaching it with her. So then I had to really learn it. I taught it with, I started to teach with her probably by 1991. We became co-teachers. Every time I went, I mean, she was the main teacher, but I was kind of her protege. 
But every time I went, I would find something different. I mean, it just became more and more nuanced because if you go to 12 of them in a short period, the Boston community was really extraordinary. I mean, like, I, I know what Helen has said about the Boston community, and she said some wonderful things about how much she loves teaching here, and I understand why having been to several communities. But so that's when I learned about it. And then I started teaching it on my own. And in 1994, I started running an Enneagram group in my house that had about 25 people in it. And that was very interesting because the way I started was I had them bring something that was important to them. It could be the most sacred thing they had. It could be funny, anything. And they talked about it and they would talk about what they would they would talk they you could really understand their motivation because this by just talking about whatever it is they brought it was deeply moving so then something interesting happened which is i said after because i gave an introduction and then we went for nine weeks going around each point and everybody brought something and you know like i think about 25 people and at the end of that <clears throat> this is a very interesting story one of the people there who was a three whose name was claire said I said, you guys want to come back? And she said, well, you know, this has been fascinating, but if you can teach us how to use the Enneagram as a spiritually transformative tool, I'll come back for another series. And if you can't, I'm not going to come back. So I said, okay, I'll teach you. Now, I had no idea how to do that, just so you can know. And when I would ask, at this point, I knew Helen and I knew Russ a little. I got to know Russ way better, but they would, like I would say, you know, well, what, 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 how would you do this? And they would, they, you know, Helen would give this smile and say like, like this cryptic phrase, well, you know, the way to essence is through the personality. That's all she would say. Led me to believe that she didn't have a good way of doing it. So I said, I'll do this. And I could, I mean, I knew psychology. I knew psychoanalysis. I knew the Enneagram really well. I knew you know, voice dialogue. I, by, the, by 1994, I had studied a lot of stuff. I knew depth psychology. I knew archetypal psychology in every way imaginable. I didn't have a clue. So it gets, this, this group meets on Tuesday nights, right? And it's Sunday afternoon. And I know what my Monday and Tuesday are like, and I don't, still don't have a clue. So I'm in my favorite position, which is lying on a couch, because whenever I can't know anything, I want to avoid it like the plague. And I start to fall asleep, and then it comes to me how to teach the Enneagram as a spiritually transformative tool. And four things came to me on that couch. This was, this was the beginning of 1995. And that's how this thing called, what I called at that point, the essence process came to me. And it was actually very moving because there was, a, there was a part to it. What came to me on that couch was very simple, which is if you could, if you could accept the thing you were most afraid to admit about yourself, then you could accept everything. So, that, and I was already at that point, you know that I do this thing that was at the time called, I was just starting to call it guided self-healing. I now call it life-centered therapy. So I knew how to put together somatics and mindfulness. And I said, well, the way you would do this is you could feel the thing that you're most afraid to admit about yourself as a body sensation which was fairly unheard of to say that it, that that fear would be a living being be in relationship with that this was like you know this this would have been january of 95 because i had, i was just moving into this house that was interesting so that's now 30 years ago so that's the first thing that came to me was that you had to find the thing you were most afraid to admit about yourself i already knew there were four levels of that but i was just focusing on the personality at the time and I focused on, well, all right, so you could literally feel that what people call the black hole as a sensation, right? And so I said, the first thing you'd have to do was to be able to fully experience it, but as something that was not that you gave so much power to. And the way to do that was to make it into, make it into something that would be a dense energy because in part it was a trauma structure. I already knew that. So any trauma structure you can experience as a discomfort. So I said, all right, you can experience that as a discomfort. You can feel it in the body, right? And then of course you would say, well, it's just something I'm experiencing. It can't be who I am because if it was who I was, I couldn't experience it. But we just gave it all this power. So we thought it was our identity. And then we had to, of course, create a whole personality. So 
but I didn't know how you would do the damn thing. So then I said, all right, well, if that's the case, then it's easy because what's the next thing? To be essential self, you have to be everything. So you'd say that's just one more experience. But if you can experience that experience, you can experience all experience and you can bear witness to all of them. So I'd say what feels like it's inside of you isn't inside you from the point of view of that one that is the one bearing witness. So I'd say you can externalize it and you can experience it just like any other dense energy. And then what you could do was you could expand and become everything. Because if you could become the thing you were most afraid of, you become what in the mystical traditions are called the fullness of the emptiness. So the, I said what you would do is you would just expand at an infinite acceleration, become boundless, boundless expand, expanding, fully expanding, infinitely expanding spaciousness that included all space and all everything. But then the thing that I realized that no one else, according to Helen, had realized, which was interesting, was that that thing that you thought was your deepest fear was really the divine. And it, it was like something that was waiting there for you to, it's like the keys to the kingdom were within, but you wouldn't know. So the thing that was really divine, you would call your worst fear, and then you'd spend your whole life not trying to do it. I had these two voices in my head that said the exact same thing. And one was your deepest fear and one was God, which I can share that with you in a second. That was a very interesting revelation that came to me about 30 years ago. So I said, okay, now what you can do is you can, instead of like being in relationship to it, like it's your fear, you could say, what is your greatest hope for me? I said no one had ever thought to ask that question that she was aware of. But she said, no one realizes that the thing you call the thing you're most afraid to admit about yourself is God. It's obvious it's God, because listen to what they both say. They say the same thing. Your deepest fear and God say the same thing. And she said, it's a revelation. And the fact that you realize that and would dialogue with it as though it were God, as opposed to your fear, I've not heard anyone talk about that. I said, it's like clear to me. You just say, what's your greatest hope for me? And then will you help me if I'm in service to you? Will you help me become it? And that was being in my essence process work. And that work I then taught at the first IEA thing. And I, but I figured I had it right straight from the horse's mouth because I would just do this process with people. And I would just keep saying to them, what do you, I mean, I would get them to find the internal fears. And then I would just say, is there something you're even more afraid to admit about yourself than that until I get to like places that no one else was talking about with these people. And that's when I wrote this paper. I wrote four papers on essence and the Enneagram starting at personality and then going to center and then going to subtype and then going to how you'd put it all together in terms of a dynamic around energetics and how you would lose yourself energetically and then what that would mean if you found yourself. And there were these series of four papers that I wrote in 95 and 96. And did that, you push them in Enneagram Monthly or anything like yeah, that? I have them in Enneagram Monthly because the, the first three were on essence and the Enneagram and the first was on personality. The second was on center. The third was on subtype. The fourth was on the energetics of the Enneagram. And Helen said, no one, I only teach the Enneagram energetically. I don't teach it any other way. And I say there are three basic energetics and every every point has an energetic every center has an energetic and every subtype has an energetic but of course they're not the same energetics as are talked about in most of the enneagram so that's very interesting because you can then you can you don't have to memorize anything about it if you can feel the energetics of what a person's center point center and subtype are and uh, that came out of all of this work too so the, the two things that really came for me were this whole thing about what the core fears were, four levels of core fears, and how we would lose ourselves energetically as opposed to being centered down and in, that we would lose ourselves either forward and out, up and diffuse, or back and in. And each of the points, each of the centers, and each of the subtypes had one of those. And I'd say, you don't have to memorize it. You could just feel <laughs> what that would be like. And then you don't have, to, and then you'll know what's motivating people and you'll, and you will just know, you'll know fundamental ways that they are in the world compulsively. And then I wrote another paper on, I originally called it the seven directions and the Enneagram. And then I called it the star of David and the Enneagram. And um, the star of David, I basically said the star of David talks about seven kind, seven levels of de seven developmental lines. You can create the whole Enneagram out of those seven developmental lines that are the, they're the two interlocking triangles. That was, I started off with Barbara as my teacher, and then from Barbara, I went to Helen. 
And I certified with Helen. And then one day I knew Russ was in Boston and I didn't go to his workshop, but I, I ended up there right when he was done. And we ended up talking for about three or four hours. And so we became kind of friends. I never actually studied with Russ, but I ended up talking a lot with Russ. And uh, what year did you certify with Helen and David? Mid late nineties. I don't know. When I heard Helen's teachers talk about the core fears, six of their core fears were external. Like they would say for the sixth that their fear was they'd be rejected. I'd say that can't be a core fear, something external. So all of them are about internal and all of them are related to the center. So five is insufficiency. Now, of course, the insufficiency is an energetic insufficiency, but it's also a mental insufficiency because they feel that way. But everything, so they compulsively have to be self-sufficient. So the, there's one core fear in my way of understanding things that creates one counterbalancing identity that becomes the core of the personality as a way of compulsively not feeling a fear. So the, and the, in, the most interesting one to me was the sixes, because three sixes within one day came up with the same core fear, and they all went into hysterical crying. And the core fear was, I am a nobody. And when they really touched into I am a nobody, which I had not heard in 19, because I was doing that in 1995, and I had three of them in that group, and they all independently, when they hit I am a nobody, and the humiliation of that, they, and it was the same, it didn't matter what their subtype was. So I knew that had to be it. So, and it, it was just really interesting to hear, to discover the core fears by just taking people, you know, deeply into the sensation of the thing they thought was the, the thing they're most afraid of and just keep having it share if there was something even more right and you know it was it was amazing and i got very lucky because the first day i did this it came to me on that sunday right and on monday i had a client who was suicidal he was the first time i saw him and he came in and he said he was suicidal it was very quick quickly clear he was a one who was really in in my understanding at the time, which I still think there's something to, he was clearly in the lower aspect of four, but he was clearly a one. And I did this process with him, right? And I kept going with him. And you know what he finally says to me? He starts off with the, the things he's done that are so bad because his, his boyfriend, he was gay, his boyfriend broke up with him and said like, you drive me crazy. And because everything has to be just so, just so, just so, right? So he starts to talk about how he's done bad things. Then he talks about how bad he is. Then you know what he says at the end? Yep. He said, I'm so bad that I belong in hell, except there are other people in hell and I'm worse than them. So where I belong is someplace that doesn't exist that's below hell. And he's like hysterically crying. I said, that's probably, that's probably it. So I said, well, it can't be who you are because you can bear witness to it. And then what happens is something extraordinary. And that's why I knew this. I still get goosebumps. This was this is now 30 years ago. I said, okay, it can't be who you are. So like you can bear witness to it like the chair in the room. It's not who you are. It's just something you're in a lot of power to. You can expand and become everything. He expands and becomes everything. And he gets a smile on his face that I wish I had a picture of. He was, he's, he was an artist. He said, there was one moment in one of my paintings where I knew it was perfection. He said, I thought I would never feel that way again. And I'm feeling it even more right now. I can remember those words. I'm getting goosebumps. That was 29 years ago. He left there, he said, I'm not feeling suicidal anymore. He still had a lot of work to do. I said, this is very interesting. And then the person that I, because you know that I, I taught you this energetic stuff, when I told her this the next day, because we were, we were building this thing together about this whole way of doing healing work. And she said, you have screwed up everything because the only thing anyone will ever need to do is essence processes. You don't have to worry about that because it, there is this phrase called give unto Caesars what Caesars and give unto God what God's. And there is still material level trauma. And it's true, I suppose, if all you ever did was, you know, work on your deepest core fears, you will hit enlightenment. But along the way, there are going to be times that you've betrayed people, and then you won't even want to feel this fear because if you believe you betrayed trust, you'll not let yourself ever get to a place where you have that much power again because you think you'll betray the trust again, particularly if you're only being another lifetime. So we're safe. 
you've maintained your therapy practice all the way through, right? Yeah. When did you become a therapist? Just putting it in context with the Enneagram. I became, I got my doctorate in 85. And so, and then in 89, I had this really weird experience that was a dream. And then I started having all of these psi experiences that ended up with the dream. The dream is foundational to the work that I just told you about. And then uh, I wrote a poem right after that dream that's the foundation of the essence work. I just didn't know it because it was, I, the poem came through about, the poem I wrote at a David White workshop and he was still unknown at the time because he was doing a workshop in somebody's house and there were 15 people there. So it was just when David White, but he had already written the poem that was what I want to know, which mm -hmm. then, what from who's he, oh, you know, Mariah Mountain, you know, turned into the invitation. Well, that poem came to me and I said, what do I want to know? And about 10 minutes later, there was this poem sitting there that is the whole of essence work. And it's a really, the first stanza of that poem is like a, a gift from the gods. David heard it, he said it's like a perfect stanza. Second stanza, I got a, a little bit of my personality. Got <laughs> Do you remember what you said in the first stanza? Oh, totally. What I want to know is when you fall, I said fall down at the time, but it's either way. What I want to know is when you fall, how do you respond? To pretend you have not fallen. And if you do, do you deny the grace that is your place when you, when you fall? Do you experience just how small you really are or deny the very essence of the truth? And in that act, deny yourself and not tend to your garden. What I want to know is when you fall down, how do you respond? Do you frown not knowing that you've grown? Do you groan at the naked pain and curse the gods as a refrain? Or do you refrain from wallowing in the pain, experiencing exquisite pain? A labor leading to creation. Now, that's beautiful, Andy. I must say that I always enjoyed your perspective because it went deeper. So anyway, going back to your question, I started with Barbara. I was with Barbara for four years. Then I was with Helen. And I certified with Helen. And then I got to know Russ. And at one point I took a, I did one thing with Russ <laughs> and something happened at that, which was, I thought, very funny. But um, the person I went with, who was also a sexual like, did not think it was very funny. And for reasons that I understood, but, you know, what can I tell you? But we both know about sexual for sexual eight relationships. Even. Yeah, they're intense. And they're, we kind of like each other's audacity. But then how we want to resolve it at the end is the opposite way. Telling me, and I have learned about your way for 30 years, and um, the sexual aid I know best has been learning about mine. And believe me, both of us could compare notes, <laughs> except let's not, because who wants that much, you know, suffering? I always found sexual fours to hold the kind of the archetype of what it means to suffer. Now, I realize that that's amplified to create a part of the defense strategy, especially the way Naranjo described it, meaning that it's a great solution if you want to be cared for. But if you ask to be cared for, people want you to either pay them back or do something differently. And that the four doesn't want to give up their autonomy. So if you're suffering, it's human nature to offer assistance without expectation rather than stating you have a need and being cared for. So, I mean, that's just a small part of a much bigger thing. But I found that that was true with each Enneagram type, that it was a way to have a need met without kind of giving up the thing that we perceived would be too uncomfortable. I'm not talking about being afraid of. I'm just saying too uncomfortable that in some way, it would make us feel vulnerable to our own type. Then I see the fear is different. And then the kind of the emotional response to it is different. So I see it on the mental, the emotional and the physical, but then the way they merge together. And that, I mean, that's why tri-type became so obvious when I started interviewing people in 1994, because they were 
they didn't know each other and they reported the same idealized images and core fears without knowing what they were for the types. I had a, a blind study of 100, but I had the people at the Stanford conference participating. So I had a nice variety. Who knew the subtypes? Who didn't? So when you learned, you learned about the subtypes from the very beginning then, right? Because Barbara studied with Helen and Helen had it in her book, a paragraph. No, I mean, I learned about the subtypes from the very beginning. I hadn't learned... Well, I'm, I'm interested in something you said, because I think with fours, I think there are three fundamentally ambivalent points. And anybody who is not an ambivalent point doesn't really get, rock what it's like to be an ambivalent point. So unless you hold both sides of the ambivalence with the ambivalent points, of which my lovely point is way up there, right? What you say is true, right? It, and it goes with the idealization denigration. It's like, of course, I want to be cared for. And of course, I want to have autonomy. And anybody who sides on one side of it, believe me, I will go to the other <laughs> and make them cuts. And so, but I say to them, Look, if, you, if, you, if, you want, if you're going to hang out with me and understand me, which of course is my shtick, you're going to have to always understand me in the context of ambivalence, which fortunately with you is not where you lead. You are the exact kind of opposite. Yeah, because yeah. I have four last. Yeah. And I have the seven, so I want to be positive. I want to be upbeat. I want to be realistic first and foremost. But then to look, I have to look towards a positive future. I can't stay in a negative past or be able to bring that to real time, but yet I can. I was just shoved down by the ape. It, but once I recognize it i just thought oh not only <laughs> not only do my mother my brother and my grandfather and other people have four but it's my heart type and then it made more sense to me but i had more of the understanding like not my mother because she was the four six times very different more talk about ambivalent really ambivalent about as ambivalent as you can get four six nine yeah i would say wrote the book on ambivalence yes exactly and so leading with eight i would think mom just go do it <laughs> you know and she said oh you're like the red queen you just say off with their heads you know and i go what and i go no, mom i just tell it like it is as a child i didn't realize that I thought the truth was my truth. I, I didn't know the difference. And using your system, how do you integrate the tri-types? It's, well, that's a, it, it's just, it, it deepens my understanding and nuances my understanding elegantly of who somebody is. I mean, that's, I guess, the quick answer. The longer answer gets longer in terms of core fears and what core fears come up and all that. But like, I can pretty quickly, I think, read people's tri types and and it's just, what can I tell you? It's sort of like being able to get much more of a fingerprint of them and and have a deep understanding from the a much more nuanced deep understanding of where they come from. I know that when. I was working with people before doing the research. I didn't need to do the research. I wasn't at a university. I wasn't getting paid. I was just curious because there was such a variety in how the types were described. And if you were at the first IEA conference, the very thing we did was compare and contrast the different teachings. And then it became very clear that if you didn't know the subtypes, there was a greater possibility of mistyping. So if you were emotional, you would be a four. If you were angry, you were an eight. It was more simplified. That was, that'd be crazy because that doesn't even look at core motivation. Core motivation, you're cooked because like emotional in your four is crazy. I mean, I know eights that are more emotional than many fours. Especially if they have four in the tri-type and six, the eight. The 846 is the most emotional. My son is that tri-type, but it, they push it down. But if it gets activated, it's, it's intense. I remember when my son would get really intense about something, I'd be impressed because my dad 
was an 873, and I was an 874, and we were nothing compared to him as a, as a little tyke. Well, it's very interesting because the woman who runs the institute with me is an 846, and a totally sexual 846, and I'm a 487, so it's, and I'm a sexual 487, so it's, it's you know, <laughs> and it's and it's easier if I was with you know on many levels the seven and the six difference in our tri types and the fact that she is eight you know eight six strongly and I'm four seven strongly you yes. know, even though we're so close we're so far apart because that six seven difference in the tri types even though for both of us right it's the third one that coloration six versus the seven because she's eight four six. And I'm four eight seven, but like that's you know, like Spencer, the sexual eight four six, exactly. Spencer and Joni should meet at some day. Yeah, yeah. When we would kind of get into an eight off, that's what we called it when when he was a kid, especially as he was like in his early teens. We would say, but you said. And then they would say, but you said, and we go back and forth and we say, but this is what I meant. And then the other would say, well, this is what I meant. And then we go, okay, and we'd be finished. But where we would go two different directions was how quickly we should get to a positive future versus how long we should spend kind of analyzing what happened. And I thought I did a lot of analysis, but it doesn't hold a candle to my son. He's a great therapist, by the way. And, and we teach together about quarterly on the tri-type relationships. But he's just phenomenal. And if the eight grows up with being understood in that context, then they learn so many things that are important that I think eights that don't get that chance they need someone benevolent in their life to see things differently. And I know that it helped me having an eight father, but it was hard with the eight mother. I mean, I understood the way she saw the world, but it wasn't the way I saw the world. You mean with a poor mother? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the six, so I didn't have doubt. And, you know, the four, six, nine is triple doubt as well as other things. And they're always looking for their answer, but then when they find it, it just raises new questions. So then it continues the pursuit. But they're interested in, in the mysteries of life in a way that was very magical for me growing up with my mother, my brothers, and I all felt that way. Well, an eight, an 873 father, social 873, and a self pres 469 mother, it was their world. They were fully developed characters <laughs> their personalities were not incomplete oh well, they were well -known. they were what they were and that's uh, the gift that they gave to all of us was be yourself whatever that is now my mom didn't like it when i was so much myself that i would split lines of what was acceptable and not because we had to follow the rules but if the rule didn't say something important I would use that as an opportunity to say, well, I, I followed the rule, but <laughs> the rule kind of was implied like when I was three and the rule was you could only go to the beach with an adult. If I saw people walking down the street that were adults and I wanted to go to the beach, I'd say, well, they're adults. And that's kind of hard for a parent. But yeah, it was very different. You're absolutely right. And I think that is so important because we have the imprinting from our parents for sure. But yeah, in I, my case, I, I'm totally, you know, I have, I was much, much closer to my mother growing up than my father, than I was to my father. And I was much closer to my mother than my father was to my mother. But like, I'm now, in terms of my introject, I'm totally, I mean, my gestures are my father. My stupid jokes to my father, except that I get to be a little bit more creative with mine because he was a social six and I'm not a sex. <laughs> so mine, of course, going to be more touching origin and his were more corny. But what can I tell you? He was charming and he was unbelievably warm. Uh, and I wish I'd had him for longer. And, you know, so. 
But yeah, so what would you say is one of the most important things you learned in this process? And what made you decide to invest so much time? Was it that spiritual guidance you had when you knew you needed to teach more of the transformational aspect that you then put more time in? I think it's intrinsic to who I am. I think that from the time I was little, I always wanted to understand all of life and I loved people. So, I mean, you run into the Enneagram on every level of understanding you can get from personality to the nature of life itself. It's all there. And, you know, I, you know, I'm an idiot. Exact so same way. Andy, with the same tri-type, I felt exactly the same way. We're just going to have slightly different colorations of it. Yeah, exactly. And lead with different perspectives. I think that's a real gift of the 478 is recognizing systems within systems in, in any order, 874, 478. But on that interpersonal level, the 478 is quite extraordinary. And then you add the sexual, and then there's a greater need for that the twinship and giving even more meaning to whatever you do. So it doesn't surprise me that you took all these different ways of looking at things and putting them together at all. You're actually a great example of the 478. And kind of the, the 478, in my opinion, is, is more like a pirate. So when it's a four, the pirate four is just more confident even though you have the internal self uh, consciousness, the seven and eight project with much more confidence. Do you identify with that? Would people? Totally. A pirate, yeah, yeah or a rock star. I was built to be a rock star. Yeah, there you go. Um, but yeah, no, I, I totally resonate with what you're saying. And um, I, I, see, I see how things fit together in the biggest pictures of things and, how diverse things that people would never say fit together. I see how that fits together. I mean, and, and, and it all is whole to me. What I didn't have, which is why it's so amazing to be with a woman who's with me as an 846, is she'll see things like that I won't see because her six will see, her six will say, wait a second, Andy. Like everybody's writing down what you're saying, like it's the word of God. But like, really, like you have to look, I mean, like what you're saying here doesn't make sense. And I say she's the only person who has ever been able to like, look at my work and say, I see what, and the reason she took it, the reason she took my course was she said, you were the first, your work was the first thing that I saw that I looked at pretty deeply that I couldn't find any holes in. So I had to take it. And <laughs> she's the only person who's ever said, Andy, what you're saying, and at first she thought it was her because she's she eight has a, a profound humility. Yes, you know. So she said, "I must not be understanding." I said, "Listen, Joni. If I say something that doesn't make sense to you, here's we're going to rank order the possibilities. First possibility is it doesn't make sense, and I have to make it make sense. The second possibility is it does make sense, but because I'm auditory first, which you are not, she's visual first. I will say something and I'll do it in a kind of glib way. And you'll say, wait a second, Andy, <laughs> it's not concise and clear enough. So it doesn't make sense. So I say 80% of the time, just assume it's me. The other 20% of the time you may be wrong, but it's only because I've been studying this stuff since I was before I was born and you haven't studied it until you were like in your, you know, late forties. So, but it's amazing. And I feel, you know, we wrote this book together and I will tell you something about, I am so like ecstatically happy with this book we wrote. And we had an editor, Joni had never written a book and had never edited anything, right? We found an editor who was the editor of editor's books who were writers. Oh found two people, best editor in the world. She signed off on our book and she said, this book is spectacular. Joni looked at it and said, she's wrong. 
There are things here that just don't make sense. And we then sat down and rewrote a third of our book after our editor said, it's perfect just the way it is. Then the editor said, read it again and said, I was wrong. This is now a masterpiece. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, it is. You're a good team to be partners and in practice together. It's really wonderful when you can find someone that you have the complementary qualities with. And it's very interesting to feel the difference of a, of a heart type intensity and a gut type intensity. I mean, they're, they're different intensities, but you know. Different type of the emotion, it's more sensate in the gut. Yeah, feelings are pushed down and go out the belly where the heart it comes forward. And it, you're more articulate, in my opinion, than eights when we're upset. We just get shorter, stonier, and more direct. I mean, the interesting thing for me, because I I experience everything energetically, I, I so experience subtypes different from the way everyone else talks about them, because they talk about them in terms of instinctual drive. I talk about them only in terms of energetic experience. And it makes for quite a difference, because one of them fundamentally is a biological way of understanding things which I appreciate, right? I mean, you had to, you have to preserve, connect, and belong. And clearly the connection has to have an erotic component to it. Although even that makes the way that most people talk about subtypes to me still doesn't make sense because I would say that if you're a sexual subtype woman and you're gazing at your baby as they're peeing on you and you're happy as a clam, I would not say that it is fundamentally about sexuality and competition. But you know, that's my different understanding of subtypes. Because if you think of it as an energetic, then it isn't really about the more biological drives. And, and I think the people who talk about it are somewhat influenced by, they think about it, I think a little bit for like the people who write about it the most. Which oh, the like, sexual? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Naranjo felt it. I mean, he, he what he did is he took a Chazo's triads, which were instinctual triads, we now call head, heart, and gut. But Naranjo noticed that there was a more primitive version of the ego types that was below the ego. And he hypothesized that if he took a Chazo's triads and put them under each ego type, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, mm -hmm. that it would be a mimic of the higher qualities of the ego type. And that's not even the essential type. And so that's where they come from. And that's why he called them subtypes. A lot of people say, oh, they aren't subtypes. Well, they are because they came from a Chazo's instinctual triads. So when you look at it that way and you go back to the kind of the driving focus and Achazo is really focused on the messages that we have. And that's why his trifix only has the mental preoccupation of the three types in his trifix. Where my research, I didn't know about trifix and neither did anyone else because he hadn't disseminated it. But it was just on people identifying with and using the language, because I'd done that lexicon research of all three centers, but in a very specific way. He talked about centers in terms of instinctual drives? Uh, well, the drive is like for the organism itself. And Naranjo varied it a little bit, but in terms of the way Achazo taught it, the three, what we call centers was a matter of Naranjo changing the language to honor a Chazo's copyright. So instead of calling them, calling it proto-analysis, he called it the Enneagram. Instead of calling it the three instinctual triads, meaning they were all core to each center. And then it was Naranjo who saw the more primitive version. But yeah, so it went on to become kind of like different use of the Enneagram in many ways. So we really can't compare them anymore. We can look at the very beginning and see the similarities. And it is meaningful that Achazo then realized you used all three 
triads, just as I had discovered. And anyone, as you know, that it, when you know people and you're doing inquiry work at a deeper level, they're going to almost invariably reveal things about those three types. Sometimes one is a little more obscure and it takes more than one three-hour session, but usually I see all of them in one session just because I'm used to the patterns that we're going to explain what we see based on what we know and what we put together. And obviously I come from having studied so many typologies that I'm using microexpressions, core energetics, everything I've ever learned. But that's what Naranjo did with all his experience and Achazo did with all his study of, you know, the ancient texts and his very philosophical, you know, forerunner in integral theory he even has a book about it because he was doing that long before he added the Enneagram as a major feature. It's really Naranjo that did that, where it became a full thing. And Naranjo added all the personality characteristics. And it's not like he took Achazo's definition of each focus, which later became fixation, the mental preoccupation, it's that Naranjo said, well, if I take Karen Horne's work, which of the types would be aggressive and more narcissistic? And which of the types would be more inclined to resign, have resignation or withdrawn? And so he just sorted them in buckets. People don't realize that. And then he kind of modified them when he like found the counterphobic six. Okay, they can seem aggressive, but they're feeling fear first. So that's another thing is Chazu didn't use that. And he left some of it in, but he took most of it out and just wanted the spiritual focus. But when Naranjo was in a way collaborating by discussing things with the Chazo, they Chazo loved Naranjo's background. He had all that experience and could fill out the Enneagram. And then later he thought it was just too far weighted towards psychology. And he thought it should go back to these fundamental, you know, focus that affected every part of us. And the dichotomies came from Achazo. The uh, doors of compensation came from Achazo. And there are a lot of things that people don't realize were only a Chazo. And Naranjo taught dichotomies, but he got them from a Chazo. So anyhow, and the same with the defense strategies, Naranjo didn't teach the defense mechanisms in the truest form. Instead, he took the Enneagram types and determined which mechanism they used the most and then tailored it more to that type, and then it became a defense strategy. So just, there are more defense mechanisms than nine. So it's a question of what fit the most, and then he slightly modified it. But I know when I'm typing people, people don't use that defense strategy of the type, and they don't have the idealized images of the type or the core fears of the type, then they probably just identify with those qualities and they might be a six or a nine but yeah so they ended up being different so are we comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges i find a lot of times it's apples to oranges but you have to look at it in the context i, I have great honoring of your intense knowledge of the history as a first-hand knowledge of the history right which i obviously don't know i mean what I know of Naranjo is I've read his two books. <laughs> Bachazo is only what you told me. So, I mean, and what I know of the Enneagram is sort of what I know from, you know, I'm a four. I can like, I, I see the world and I say, huh, oh, that makes sense to me. How does that all fit together? And, you know. Well, and that's the gift of four. The gift naturally is thinking that way. And then the four, seven, eight is everything about what makes people tick or what they really mean or what's the meaning beyond that. Like my mother said that she thought she was analytical, but, and, and by not analytical, not just 
thinking in limited structures, but seeing how things interconnect. But she felt like she was a bug on a board with me because I'd say, mommy, you said, but you didn't really, your face didn't say that. You you were angry. <laughs> and even when I was like two years old, I'd say, mommies are supposed to feed their children. Or I would just like kind of stand up for all the kids <laughs> because we'd be hungry. But it would be maybe a time when she was finally enjoying herself. And of course, we didn't understand that. We just knew that we didn't want any more cheese and crackers. We wanted dinner. But if we look at it through the lens of the 478, I've never met a 478 that doesn't delve into kind of the, the interconnections of everything. Because all three types, one way or another, want to know, like, the eight wants to know what makes people tick. Like we know that their motivation, but we want to know why they feel motivated to do what they're doing. And the seven is just seeing all the possibilities. And then four is giving the meaning to all those connections. It's a pretty interesting combination. So we usually have our own message. They finally, the four, seven, and eight together finally decided on the word, the messenger. Sometimes people, well, where did that word come from? I go, well, the sevens wanted catalyst. And it was more that the four and seven could all agree that they studied everything that fascinated them and they put it together and whatever they learned, they kept building on or finding a place for it and then refining it. And then absolutely had to tell other people about it. It wasn't enough to just know it. Would you identify with that? Totally. So yeah. What we want to do right now is, you know, share this work with the world so that, you know, that I'd be of service and like, you know, like I see people, like I, I see these things and I say, of course, all I want to do is share it with everybody so that people, there'll be less suffering. Yeah. To ease suffering. What a wonderful thing to say. Yeah. And I, that's what I want to do as well. I just, why should people be judged harshly by what they don't know? And throughout my career, even when I was working, training people that were makeup artists or working in the department stores, I'd pull the representatives out of the stores and teach them personal empowerment. And the buyer of the store would say, Catherine, what does that have to do with cosmetics? I go, well, if you want them to really do well, they need to understand themselves. And she said, okay, I'll just watch the numbers. And I taught them MBTI. I taught them, I mean, I sure, I would tell them about the new launches, but it wasn't enough. I wanted people to know who they were and to not feel disempowered because they were an extrovert in an introverted world or the other way around. And I just wanted everybody to be on a fair playing field. And I didn't like people being disadvantaged or marginalized or underrepresented. And even the most, you know, popular kids would struggle with something, a way in which people were envious or they couldn't be themselves. They had to maintain this kind of image to hold their position. And it's just, I thought, well, all of us need a... <laughs> something that will help us feel more content and so that was my goal is to also but i wouldn't think to add the word suffering but it's definitely what i do or why i do what i do because why otherwise why was i teaching people in department stores about personal empowerment why was i teaching about their personality types or why was I teaching them the color theory? It was whatever they needed to know to be empowered wherever they were. Obviously, we're doing the same thing. We both want to free people from suffering and free them to be empowered to live the life that they're to live. Exactly. Yeah, in closing, tell us the name of your book. And the One Hour Mirror. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. When I read it, I say, wow, this is a great book. <laughs> No, I mean, it's like, and you can tell, I mean, it, it, it's so, you read the first couple of chapters, right? And it's all there, just what's fundamental about how, why people suffer and how you can stop. And you can read it in a couple of chapters. And I think it's, 
simple, but most people don't know. So, well, thank you, Andy. I know it's great because I've been through your training probably in the 90s, right? Or the 2000s? I don't know when you were teaching it in Berkeley, but. Probably in the late 90s. I would yeah. Say. Yeah. Yeah, David and I both went. And that, it was just major, but I was even impressed in that training. And maybe it was in Baltimore where you used an example and did your process. I think it was the Helen Palmer group. Yeah, that would make sense since you certified with Helen. So I think it was 97 in Baltimore. And then you took cute little blonde, I can't think of her name, little six. I think she was a six, she might've been a four. And see, that's where I can see your face, I can see you, I can see all of us in a circle. But you took her through the process and some people were like, what? <laughs> And other people were, yes. And because it was so progressive for its time, truly. And I went, yes. <laughs> I was one of the yes people. Well, I feel very honored if you were a yes person. Yeah, I was a yes person. Absolutely. Because I already had so many atypical things that I knew were just true. And if I was going to you know, teach personal empowerment in the cosmetic industry, you know, I was going to do my own thing in my own way anyhow. So whatever I learned, I taught everyone else. And I know you do that. And what I noticed is that it just was such a, to have the combination of having your skills and knowledge as a therapist, and you had your doctorate, and then and you knew the Enneagram, and you made these correlations and then added something so meaningful and so quick compared to what was out there. It really stood out for me, for sure. So thank you, Andy, for all your contributions. And I know it's a great book. I look forward, to, I'm gonna get it soon. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I, if you do get it and you, you feel called to read it, which I would be deeply honored, I, of course, would want to know anything you think about it because I have obviously been. Oh, I'm sure I'll love it. I've loved all your work. My work thanks you and the work thanks you and life thanks you. Well, thank you, Andy. Good night. It is. It's been a great night. Bye. <laughs>